I am a fully loaded Nissan Versa with a few grand in your pocket, just in bumpers on this car. So the last time I was here in the VinWiki HQ, I brought my Lamborghini Murcielago for Ed to see and sort of make fun of because it was at the time the worst example of a Lamborghini that I've ever seen. And hopefully anybody's ever seen because nobody should see a Lamborghini in that state. It's just bad. So I proceeded to take that car and build it into a uh, <laughs> million dollar show car here. Um, so, I, I, I basically made it in the image that the movie uh, Fast and the Furious 8 or Fate of the Furious wanted it to be. I wanted it to be the hero car that it never was. Now, for those of you that don't know, movie cars aren't very well taken care of. If you ever go to a museum or anything like that, you'll see a movie car and just look at the interior or look at the paintwork or look at the bodywork. It's always metal screws, it's always like self tappers, it's always duct tape, and it's always wearing very, very poorly. It's extremely rare that a movie car actually looks as good as it does in the movie in real life. But I wanted that real life experience, and I also wanted a nice Lamborghini, so I decided to completely restore this car. It was originally gonna be just a throw around, daily driver, nitty gritty, Murcielago, but then it turned into this, this insane restoration project where one layer turned into another layer, turned into $10,000 to $20,000. And uh, I learned a lot and I learned what to do and what not to do. And um, my bank account learned a lot as well. So here's what it's like to go from a really uh, used and abused movie car into a SEMA show car in the span of about nine months. So I started off with this movie car and it had a roll cage that was bolted into it. It had the windshield that was taken out uh, in the back. It had windows that didn't roll down. It was stuck with a piece of wood. It had uh, an exhaust that was a straight pipe. So you were literally piping exhaust gases into the cabin as you were driving. So. It's not good for your brain cells, it can't be. It had electronics that didn't work. The engine sounded very, very raspy. It sounded like two really angry 350Zs getting in some sort of uh, boxing match. It also didn't have very good tires. The brakes were tired uh, and the paintwork was atrocious. So I decided to strip all that down, took the bumpers off, took the roll cage off, um, decided to do a lot of things to the uh, the engine bay, I did a full tune up, uh, did a complete exhaust system. And the paintwork was actually one of the most integral parts. So I had the paintwork done by a shop called Color Recon and they found out that there were 11 layers of paint on the front fenders. Now the reason for this is not because they just love painting the car so much, it's because during the filming of the movie, they had different uh, color schemes. Originally the car was, uh, instead of being orange like it is now, the car was supposed to be Arctic camo. So it was supposed to be like white, gray, and black and like little Arctic, what looks like an Arctic camo on a ghillie suit or something. And what happened was when they went to shoot it out in Iceland, in the movie it was supposed to be in Russia, when they got it out onto the ice, the cameras couldn't pick it up. It was really hard to see. I guess Arctic camo kind of does its job. So they decided to paint it essentially in a parking lot somewhere in Iceland. So you see these horrible, horrible runs everywhere. And when they shot, they were shooting on a, in the scope of about three months, they shot so much that they had to redo bumpers. They had to make their own molds for bumpers. And as you can imagine, the fit and finish of making your own bumper that's based on copies of copies of copies, there's a little bit of leeway and the, uh, what looks good from a hundred feet away on camera might not look good from five inches. So the fit and finish and quality was completely horrible. Also, they kept on respraying the car because well, the car got a ton of rock chips. It got, it got a ton of damage during filming. And it was just one of those things where it, it became a, 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 the paint was like half an inch thick. It was, it was disgusting. So all that had to be hand sanded because if you put it in a situation where it was like media blasted or soda blasted, that could harm the carbon fiber underneath. Because I don't know what the structural integrity of carbon fiber is 
in Italy in 2003, but I can't imagine it's good. Everything was hand sanded and 11 layers of paint takes a little bit of time. So all that was taken down right to the bare primer. Then they went over it with a, uh, a guide coat. Then they went over it with a, uh, a base coat. I mean, th this, was, this was coat, sand, coat, sand. And then we can have uh, the color layer, which is Arancio Argos, which was a launch color for the Aventador. And then we had seven layers of clear because we wanted that nice, nice sparkle. And then they also wanted to make sure that they could uh, have a very level and flat finish. And we also did some body work. Lamborghinis don't really dent because they are made of carbon fiber. Carbon fiber doesn't dent, it just cracks. But what happens on uh, Lamborghini Murcielagos is that every Murcielago that you see, if it hadn't had paint work and it hasn't been in the body shop like me or Ed's, they have these things I like to call old man dents because people that buy them usually are old men and they need help getting out of the car. So what they do is they put their elbow on the roof of the car, the very, very thin steel roof, and they make a little crease with their elbow. And every single Lambo has this, that has this little wave right next to the door. So all those are taken out. We had a lot of complications because the, the actual car has way too many angles. I mean, you think that, oh, it's just, you know, a straight car and no, it has so many ins and outs and everything has to be painted. And uh, there's some things that have to be taped off. And the entire thing, if I didn't work out a deal with this company, would have cost somewhere upwards of $40,000. And the paint alone was somewhere in the vicinity of $2,000. Just the, the paint, just in sitting in the bucket is two grand. But that would be manageable if I didn't have to buy new bodywork. Now, the bodywork that I thought was good on the car, the body shop called me and they said, well, we can't do anything with this because it was just, it's basically a homemade bumper, front and back. And as Fast and the Furious is wont to do, they didn't use the stock bumpers. I could get stock bumpers on eBay that need a little bit of work for a few grand. It's expensive, but I can get them. Fast and the Furious did not do that. They used a aftermarket Premier 4509 kit made by Veilside. And Veilside is kind of a running theme with Fast and the Furious. They had a Veilside kit on the uh, in Tokyo Drift and, and in all the other Fast and Furious movies. They had Veilside as a, as a Premier member. But this body kit was so rare, and as you can imagine, the marketplace for a Mercy body kit is not huge. So these were made to order, if not discontinued. So I got in touch with the one supplier that makes these, and they said, yeah, we can get them to you, but it's a 60 day wait at the very least. Uh, they have to be made in Japan. And if you want the front bumper, that's gonna be $10,000. Well, $10,000 is more than I would spend on a car. So I said, do you have any other options? They're like, oh yeah, so $10,000 is with the carbon fiber option. If you want it just for fiberglass, that's $5,000. I went, okay, well, 5,000 is still way more than I would spend on a bumper. So I said, okay, well, I, I need a front bumper. This is something that's gonna be the, literally the face of the car. So I said, okay, let's do $5,000. So I, I, I pay them the money, wait 60 days, and then I, I get the bumper and it's in decent decent shape, but I, I wouldn't say it's 100%. I mean, for a $5,000 bumper, you'd, you'd want everything to be, you'd want it to do your taxes for you at this point. So I got that on, uh, it got painted at the body shop, everything's good. And then they look at the rear bumper and they go, we can't use this. And I go, great. Okay, good, good. Because I thought that the rear bumper was actually serviceable and they could make something of it. And they're like, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be like 100, 150 hours just to get us to, you know, refiberglass things and make sure that uh, things line up because there were like real big issues. They would have to section it and stuff like that. So I said, okay, let me work on getting a rear bumper. So since I know, now I know where I can get them. And it turns out <laughs> the rear bumper is $12,000. Now, that was for the expensive carbon fiber bumper. But I said, ah, I know that you guys have cheaper bumpers. So how much are your cheaper bumpers? They go, okay, it's like six grand. Okay, it's a little bit more than the front bumper, but it's for, it's for a show car, so it's fine. Uh, so let's do the bumper for six grand. Yeah, we don't have that. So the only one we have in stock is the carbon fiber one, which is $12,000. So I can get that for you in a week, or you have to wait more than 60 days and hopefully we can get this in stock, maybe. So I spent $12,000 plus $5,000. I am a 
fully loaded Nissan Versa with a few grand in your pocket, just in bumpers on this car. So that was a that was a real wake up call because a lot of people don't know this about exotic cars. There are like levels to them. When I started doing this with my Lamborghini Gallardo, that was one level. That was like the entry level. That's like a little bit above like an Infiniti or a Lexus. Like you'll pay a grand or, or two for a bumper used. But then you have a level above that where it's like the luxury and exotic cars that were one handmade, two, they didn't make any of them, and three, they're old and nobody has parts for them. So it's not like people are stocking these things. So I was dealing with all of that and every single part in that car was very hard to get and it was extremely expensive. So let, let me just go over like a little bit of rundown. So 17 grand in bumpers. If I wanted to uh, do the uh, little bumper eyelids, they are the flaps for the washers. Each of those are $750. That doesn't even include the washers, that doesn't include the, uh, the actual bracket, just the covers alone, $750 each. I didn't buy them, I made them myself from aluminum and I just double, double sided taped them on. Nobody knows, nobody, nobody knows. Also, I had a bunch of tubing that goes to the alternator. It is a cooled alternator, an air cooled alternator. That is uh, about $300, just a, just a tubing alone. It's about eight feet of tubing. So it's 300 bucks for Lamborghini. However, I got some tubing from an aircraft supply place for 25 bucks. So it's exactly the same thing. It's actually a little bit better. And uh, the tubing then connects to a duct, which is another $900 and it's special order from Italy. The jury's out on whether, whether that comes in in time for anything. So uh, what I did is I made a uh, attachment from my wet dry vac because it looks the same. I made a little bracket and nobody nobody's the wiser and it does exactly the same job and it was literally free. But the things I did have to pay for were, well, let's say the, the retail cost on everything that I did, where the paint was about 40 grand. The interior, which was completely trashed, I had that redone in a, uh, a very nice uh, pattern with diamonds, not even diamond stitching, it was a hexagon stitching from the newer Audis and uh, Lamborghini Huracans. I had a, a forged carbons center console. I had uh, everything redone to look like a modern car, like my envisioning of what a modern car would look like. That was about $25,000. Then we have wheel refinishing, which was another $1,000. We had uh, tires, which was another $2,000. Like it just, it just adds and adds and adds. And also all the little nickel and dime parts that you go, oh yeah, I'll, I'll take care of that later. Those parts takes months to come in and they're always a three or four digit number. So. I'm looking forward to, to when I make the video of going down my entire receipt list and seeing what that number is at the end because that number is gonna be very surprising. Now I bought the car for $80,000, which was the lowest price of any Murcielago up to that point, any running Murcielago. I'm sure that the, there's some salvage title ones that went for less. But this car now is well, I, I believe well over double that, uh, which is in the range of where a normal Murcielgo would go, but now I have some provenance and now it drives very nicely. And now it's just a car that I can just drive around and be proud in and potentially take to shows or if museum wants it or something like that, then uh, that's the car to show. I don't know if I would do it again because it was, it was an insanely stressful experience taking that car to SEMA where thousands of people could see it up close. That was a that was a very stressful experience indeed. So I don't know, at the end you kind of, you know, you get a Lambo, you work on it, you you realize that they're all sort of kit cars in the, in the end and they're, they're not built very well. And all the, the, the screws and the fasteners, they're, they're made with such a standard that, well, let, let's just say that Lamborghini standards in the early 2000s weren't putting Toyota out of business. <laughs> True negotiation starts with finding the right car, and the best way to do that is with Autotempest.com. Autotempest allows you to search nationally through all the major listing sites with one search. Autotempest, all the cars, one search.